All right. Well, I want to welcome you to Dungeness Community Church. We're so excited that you're here to worship with us in person. Or if you're online worshiping with us, we want to say hi to those folks as well. And we're just going to have an awesome day of worship in the Lord. Bob's got a great message. We've got great, I've already heard the worship. It's awesome today. And so uh, let's pray together and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this day and the opportunity that we have to be here today. Thank you, God, for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace that's new every single day, God. We pray that we worship you today in spirit and in truth, Lord. Let us fellowship together. Let us praise you. Let us let us uh, hold our prayers up to you, God, and just have an awesome day of worship. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, announcements. Good morning, and welcome to Dungeness Community Church. If you're joining us for the first time, please stop by the welcome desk to receive a gift bag with more information about DCC. If you're viewing online, click the connect button on our website. We'd love to get to know you. July 23rd is Faith and Family Day for the Seattle Mariners at T-Mobile Park. The M's take on the Houston Astros at 1.10 p.m. Tickets are $25 and transportation to and from the ballpark is included. Sign up online or contact the office for more details. As a reminder, the Cameras and Coffee Group meets on the third Monday of every month at 7 o'clock p.m. in the auditorium. This month's photo theme is self-portraits. To learn more about this group, visit us online or contact the office. Christian Cycling will be offering a bicycle tune-up repair day on June 22nd as part of an outreach to the community. All tune-ups and repairs are free while parts and supplies last. They're also collecting bicycles and bicycle parts for donation to build bicycles for the homeless. To learn more about Christian Cycling or this event, visit the table in the foyer today. And now for a message from one of our Advent Conspiracy recipients. Hi, I'm River Sussman. I'm the CEO for Obria Pacific Northwest Medical Clinics. I want to thank DCC. You guys have been a great support to our organization for many, many years, and we really appreciate um, the support that you give to us, not just in the financial funding, which we definitely appreciate and it helps to fund our programs, but also we have received so many uh, volunteers and staff members from your congregation. You guys are just one of the places that warms my heart when I think of. So thank you, DCC. Essentially, we are the pregnancy center of the community. We started off in 1983. We now provide pregnancy tests. We provide ultrasounds. We also most recently added STD testing and treatment to our services. In addition, we have education and resource programs which provide lessons in prenatal development, birthing, child development, child care, and in exchange, the moms get baby bucks and they can trade those in for diapers and cribs and car seats and all kinds of maternal and infant support. You may know us as the Crisis Pregnancy Center of Port Angeles, the Crisis Pregnancy Center of Clallam County, CareNet, My Choices, and now we are Obria PNW. We have offices in Squim, Port Angeles, and Port Townsend. We also have a mobile unit that's been serving all of rural Western Washington for the last four years, partnering with pregnancy centers that did not have ultrasounds. In 2021, we served over 200 individuals. There were 338 classes that were taught and 29 babies that were saved. That's a full classroom of kindergartners in five years. One of the exciting things that's happened this year is that we now have four nurses that are on staff. So there is a nurse in our office every single day, every single office that we're open. Once again, I really want to thank you all at DCC. You guys are, are just so valuable to us. Your support is valuable to us. The fact that you hear God and his care for these babies and these moms and these fathers is just an awesome thing. And it so helps us and it's so, so keeps us going when things are challenging. Thank you. And now let's join the worship team. Good morning, church. Will you please stand and worship with us in song? Over me. 
Savior, I come, quiet my soul. seated and would you pray with me heavenly father we are so grateful to be here before you this morning to meet with you to learn from your word to worship you lord we pray that you would help us to give our whole hearts over to you today and that you would reveal your heart to us through your word so that we would know you in a deeper way lord that more of yourself would be part of us and we just ask this in jesus precious name amen Good morning, kids, parents, and grandparents. Pastor Britt here with what's going on in today's Go lesson. Gideon, one of Israel's judges, was faced with an angry crowd from the tribe of Ephraim. They weren't happy Gideon didn't include them in a battle against the Midianites. But Gideon had followed God's instructions, and he could easily have responded with anger and defensiveness. Instead, he responded with gentleness and respect, and the people of Ephraim took it great. Then, years later, another judge named Jephthah angered the people of Ephraim 
But instead of speaking kindly, Jephthah spoke harshly. Guess what? Ephraim didn't take it so great. Our words make a huge difference. Kind words are far more likely to bring about peace than angry ones. That's what we're learning from the book of Proverbs in today's lesson. The big idea for the lesson is God wants us to use our words for peace. And the lesson verse is, a gentle answer turns anger away, but mean words stir up anger. That's Proverbs 15 verse 1. It can be hard to use our words wisely, especially when our emotions are running high. But God wants our words to bring about peace. How can you use your words to bring peace to someone this week? Kids, you're dismissed. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Have a great morning. Well, good morning again. So I think, I hope I've got my days right. Today's Father's Day, right? So Lance Lewis, what a rookie move. You didn't even say Happy Father's Day to everybody. <laughs> do, do they not have Father's Day in Texas? Is that a thing that you guys don't do? Rookie move. All right. So I've got some good news and bad news. The, good, the bad news is that this message is about twice as long as last week's, and I couldn't even finish last week's. But when Tim asked me to do this, Months ago, he said, let's take three weeks and do this. I said, okay, cool. Then he called me and said, let's take two weeks and do this. So if you have any complaints, call Tim. And the other good news is I just found out something about technology. This is on YouTube. So people are watching us live on YouTube right now. Hello, everybody out in YouTube land. But you guys can watch on YouTube too. So because I've got so much to say, I'm going to speak faster than I even normally do. But if you go on YouTube, I found it's cool. There's a little gear on the bottom of it. You can turn the speed down. And I took my last message I did, and I tried that. If you took it, if you turn it to about halfway, it sounds like a normal guy is talking. So if, if you can't keep up, and if you can't write the notes, and can't get the slides, just go to YouTube and play it at half, and you'll be, just, you'll be right in there. It'll be perfect. All right, so. Let's start off. So last week, we, we laid a foundation for truth versus lies. Um, oh, good. We're up there. So um, we got the trail of truth, and we laid the foundation. I didn't get into any, into any specifics. I kind of just gave a general overview. So today, I want to take one specific, and it's, it's not rated higher than any other specific. We could have talked about a lot of things. Um, anyone that knows me knows that my, my pet causes abortion. I really, really can't stand the fact that we murder our preborn children. Um, I was a Mormon before I became a Christian, so I could have talked about cults. Um, I've got kids that went through secular universities, so I could have talked about how corrupt our institutions are getting. There was a lot of things, but I had to pick just one. So if we get time, it'll come up and you'll see it. If not, you'll just have to guess. I think I'll get that far. So some of you who know me well know that I like to cook. I love to cook, and I'm actually pretty good at it. So I love cooking, and cooking is a little combination of art and science together. You have to have experience. You have to kind of know what you're doing, but also there's some science involved. There's some technology, and there's two pieces of technology I use when I cook. Number one is a timer, and number two is a probe thermometer. If you're cooking, you're not using those things. You have to be careful. You could kill people. You serve people raw chicken, and you know, you'll end up paying their medical bills. So I use a thermometer, and I use a... a uh, timer. I love steak. Steak is one of my favorite things in the world. I love meat. In fact, yesterday, my wife called me. I was at work. One of my kids sent me a Father's Day package, a butcher box. Have you ever seen those? So I can't afford them. So, but I've got a kid that went through school, and he makes good money. And it had, there was sausages in there, and bacon in there, and steaks in there, and ribs in there. So for the next little while, I'm going to have good stuff to cook. I love New York strips. I love ribeyes. My favorite is T-bone. If I ever have another kid, we're going to name him T-Bone. <laughs> T-Bone Taurus. So my wife and I haven't discussed that yet, but um, I'm sure she'll be on board. So if T-Bone Taurus ever comes along, that'll be, that'll be my guy. So I was cooking steak, and I've got two ways to do it. Number one is if I don't care if the neighbors see, I use my outdoor grill, and I crank that thing up to 1,000 degrees. I take my steak, and I drop it on there, facing at 10 o'clock. I hit my little timer for two minutes. 
pick it up, turn it over to 2 o'clock, hit my timer for two minutes, flip it over back to 10 o'clock, two minutes, turn it back to 2 o'clock for two minutes, take it off, put it on a rack, take it inside, let it cool, and just don't touch it. Don't touch it, don't cut it, don't poke it, just leave it alone, and that steak will be perfect. So I've got that down just right. So I told you that to tell you that that's not what I want to talk about. There's another way to cook steaks if you don't want your neighbors to know you're having steak, and that's cooking it indoors on the stove. So the way I do that is I turn my oven on to 350. I've got this really good stainless steel, thick old heavy pan, and I'll take it and I'll get it rocket hot, and I throw that steak in there, sizzle up, smoke starts coming up. You turn it over for just about a minute, sizzles up, and then you take the whole thing, you stick in the oven for five, 10 minutes, and it comes out just about perfect. So on the grill, I use my timer. But in the, in the house, I use a thermometer because I need to know when it's the right temperature. And I like my meat right around 130 degrees. Um, I know my Texas guy probably likes it at 90 degrees, but I like my steak 130 degrees or so. So I stick, so it's in the oven there, and I stick my probe thermometer in there, and it says 56 degrees, 57 degrees. And I'm thinking that is absolutely, that's physically impossible. And I thought, well, you know what? I know what happened. I had this thing in the freezer before. I stuck it in the fridge to thaw out. It must just be frozen in the middle still. That makes perfect sense because you know it's taking internal temperature. So I dropped the, I dropped the temperature down just a little bit so it cook in the middle and not burn the outside. 57, 58, 59, 60, and it's nowhere near 130. So I thought, what in the world? Maybe I didn't have the searing pan hot enough. Maybe I, I, I just didn't have the oven hot enough. And I'm watching the steak shrink up and little wisps of smoke are coming off of it, and it's getting smaller and smaller. And, and I, I'm looking at the thermometer, 69, 70, 71. I'm thinking, oh, I know what happened. This was a tri-tip steak. I cook New York strips, T-bones, I cook the steaks I like, but I also, remember we talked about truth, some things are immutable. One of the immutable truths about me is I buy what's on sale. And these, these were cheap at Safeway, they were tri-tip steaks. And I remember tri-tip usually comes as a roast, not as a steak. So I'm thinking, well, that's what it is. It, it, it thinks it's a roast. It's taking longer to cook. <laughs> and it hit me that, you know what? This doesn't know what it is. It's a piece of meat. It doesn't know where it came from. It doesn't know what it is. It's just something's funny. So it goes and goes and goes, and it gets up to about 87 degrees. It was 83 degrees, it got up to 83 degrees, and now it's just like a hockey puck. It's just tiny, my kitchen is full of smoke, the fire department's coming up. It's just, there's something's wrong. And in my heart, I know it's wrong. I've cooked a million steaks, but my thermometer is telling me it's 83 degrees, and, and, I, and I don't want to die from eating raw meat. So I take it out, put the thing on my stove, put the meat on my little cutting board, take my steak knife, start to cut it, and I couldn't cut it. It was just completely dead. It, it had gone from being meat back to being leather again. I'm trying to cut it, and it won't cut. And I've got this one really expensive, really nice, wussed off German steel bread knife. Laser edge sharpened, serrated, it will cut through anything. And I take out my beautiful steak knife, it's, or, or my bread knife, and this knife, if you look at it wrong, it'll cut your finger. That's how sharp this knife is. It'll do it. So I take my bread knife out, and I'm cutting, and I'm sawing. It's not going through. I finally push it, get it through, and it's just completely like charcoal in the middle. It's just dead, and I thought, what in the world happened? So I look back, and somewhere during the night, I don't know when it happened or how it happened, but somewhere during the night, someone, probably a Canadian, <laughs> switched my thing from Fahrenheit to Celsius. When I put it back to Fahrenheit, it was 190 degrees. <laughs> now, I use Fahrenheit because that's what God uses in heaven. <laughs> Is Brian O'Hare here? Brian, if you're here, you know I love you. I just don't trust Canadians anymore. <laughs> so if you guys see Brian, don't ever let him touch your thermometer. Anyway, so I started thinking, there's got to be some kind of lesson in this, because I'm throwing away a whole piece of meat. And it, my mind went back to the burnt offerings, you know, because I had just made a burnt offering. And I thought, you know, I trusted what my, what my science was telling me. I trusted my instrument there, even though in my heart, in my eyes, with my senses, with my smoke detectors, I knew that it wasn't true. But I trusted it because it had to be right, right? This is science. This is technology. It's got to be right. 
So that's kind of how I started thinking about truth and lies, truth and error. We as a society, starting with our kids in school, we're starting to be taught to trust the science rather than trusting what you know in your heart is true. Rather than trusting what you've experienced, remember the disciples said, that which we've seen, that which we've touched, that which we've handled with our own hands, that which we know about Jesus, we make, we make known to you. Well, no, let's not go that way anymore. Let, let, let's trust these numbers. Let's trust the science. And what's happening is somewhere in our school system, somewhere in our society, we've set our thermometer from true to lies. But just like I trusted the Fahrenheit to Celsius, we believe it even though we know we shouldn't. And it's, it's, as adults, it's hard for us. But as kids, it's even harder. Um, you know, Ryan will tell you, and I worked with the youth group for a long time, it's harder for the kids. I remember asking the kids in youth group, you know, do you, do you do any witnessing at all? Well, no. Well, because we don't want to be canceled. We don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be made fun of. Well, do you at least do you even just pray over your meal in the cafeteria? It's a, it's a good way to witness without using any words. Well, no, people will make fun of us. So that's where I kind of want to start, is that the world is telling us one thing. The world is like the, <clears throat> the thermometer. God is telling us another thing. God's like the oven. God's the reality. God's the one that's burning your steak. So God is what's real. The thermometer actually wasn't wrong, right? I just misinterpreted it. So we can look at God and, and understand what God wants us to do and how God wants us to live. And then we can look at science, because I don't think science is against God, but we need to learn how to interpret it correctly. I don't think um, society and, and, and our whole social structure as a whole is against God. We just need to learn how to interpret what's really going on. And we need to be Fahrenheit Christians, maybe in the Celsius world. And we need to all quit hanging out with Canadians. So. <laughs> I've got one other problem is these glasses, I used to be able to really, really read my notes with these glasses and I can't anymore. So I think my glasses are getting old. I think, <laughs> I think they're just wearing out. So let me see if I can get my notes here where we just left off. Oh, so we talked about truth and lies, but I want to make today a little bit more practical. I want to talk about how-tos today. Because last week was more philosophical. Today I want to talk about, or more theological, philosophical. Today I want to get down to some grassroots. And like I told you, I can only pick one example. So this one example isn't higher or lower on the list. It's just the one that I picked. So first of all, how do we tell the truth? If we want to tell the truth, how do we tell the truth? I got to point this at the piano, right? OK, so truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. That's the first thing we've got to understand is that when you start speaking the truth, truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. But that doesn't mean that the thermometer is right. Just because someone or everyone tells you, no, I hate you, that's not right, that's hate speech, it doesn't make it true just because they're saying it. Most of the world is on a Celsius scale where truth is the Fahrenheit. The further society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. So when we started off with, you know, in quotes, that we were a godly nation, now we're coming over here to where we don't want God to have anything to do with our nation. The further we get from the truth, or the further society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. So if, if people hate the truth in the first place, and our society is going further and further away, the more they're going to hate the people that speak the truth. Well, that was George Orwell, by the way. And then no one is more hated than he who speaks the truth. So not only do people hate the truth, not only are people starting to get, get further away, society's get further away, and the truth that sounds worse, he who, no one is more hated than he who speaks the truth. Plato, not Plato, Plato. <laughs> and then, you will be hated by all because of my name, Jesus. So if you don't want to trust Orwell or Plato, you can trust Jesus. You will be hated by all because of my name. So let's go. John chapter 16, verse 7. I'm going to do what I did last week. I'm going to read the scriptures to you. I had someone actually come up to me after and say, you know, I love hearing the sound of, of Bible pages uh, turning. You never get to hear that sound too much anymore. So the truth. John 16, verse 7, we'll start at. John 16, 7. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper should not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Satan was judged at the cross. I have many more things to say to you. That's the theme of my message. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. And he shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. That's how you learn truth. Most of us think we learn truth by reading, by studying. And when you read and study, you learn truths with the S on the end. Remember we talked last week about the difference between A and the? Studying will teach you a truth. It'll teach you some truths. It'll teach you true things. But the truth, capital T, the truth, comes from God, comes through the Holy Spirit. If you are in a position where you're trying to decide on your life how to live, what to do, how, how should we live, what's real, you'll be disappointed in what the world tells you. It will never, it'll never satisfy you. Only truth through God, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Remember that? The truth, the tr whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. That's the only thing that's going to fulfill that longing that you've got. And it comes through the Holy Spirit. And, and we've kind of chopped it up a little bit. The truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me, God. We've cut the so help me, God part right off. That part's just gone. The whole truth, well, we're not real, pop we're not real big on the whole truth anymore. Nothing but the truth, we're not real big on that anymore either. So what we're left with are little truths, little pieces of truth, and you're left to interpret them and see how, they're, how, they, how they relate to the truth. So, and so how do you do it? First of all, don't spend too much studying lies. I know that people want to know. They, they, they buy the books, they buy the tapes, they watch the series. Let me encourage you, don't spend too much time studying lies. Spend much more time studying the truth. Spend much more time getting to know Jesus better. Spend much more time walking on your walk with Christ. Then when the counterfeit comes up, <clears throat> you'll know it. It'll be automatic. You'll feel it. You'll sense it. You'll know, I don't know exactly what's wrong with that, but it's not right. You've probably all heard the way they teach bank tellers, you know, to spot counterfeit money. Um, they don't show them counterfeit bills. They show them real bills. And then when a counterfeit one comes up, they, just, they know it's different. So that's how they teach tellers how to, to tell counterfeit money from real money. They don't spend time studying the counterfeits. They spend a lot of time with the real thing, and then the counterfeit makes itself known to them. Um, the last church I was at, we had a guy we called the Mushroom Man. Some of you might know the Mushroom Man. He sells stuff at fairs here and all that. Someone asked him, you know, because we go in the woods a lot, how do you tell which mushrooms are bad, and how do you tell which mushrooms are good? Because the bad ones can kill you. And he said something I thought was really cool. He said, don't even try to learn the bad ones. There's just too many. Just focus on learning the good ones. Then if you see one and it's not something you recognize, just leave it alone. Don't focus on the ones that'll kill you. Focus on the good ones. And then when you see one that isn't right, you'll know. Focus on the good ones. And then Tim and I um, are up at Bible school and Bran in our class, and there was a girl in our class that was really smart. I used to hate that. She was really smart. Tim took the pastoral trail, which is taught in English. I took the Greek trail, because I'm cooler than Tim. And then there's another trail where you learn Hebrew that was just too hard to even comprehend. Well, this girl took all three of them. She did English, Greek, and Hebrew, and it takes four years to finish. I think she finished all those things in three years. This girl was really, really smart. Um, what she thought she was called to do was to be an apologist to fight cults. And she learned the Greek, she learned the Hebrew, she learned, I mean, this girl knew it all. She went to Berkeley, California to study cults. The last I heard that she had joined the cult. So, I mean, here you've got a godly, smart person, friend of Tim and Brandon and I's, who ended up thinking, I'm gonna spend all my time in the false so I can prove the true, and she, and she got sucked into it. So, First of all, the truth can only be known through God. God is the truth. Second, don't spend a lot of time on the false. Don't, get all, don't spend your life, don't spend your time involved in all the false. Spend your time with God. Spend your time in the Bible. Spend your time in prayer. Spend your time with other Christians. Spend your time learning to listen to the Holy Spirit. Then when you come across a bad mushroom, you'll know. 
You won't have to know what they all are. You'll just know. And in our society, we're getting more and more and more bad mushrooms every day. Um, I've gotten to where my wife, I can't even watch the news anymore. I used to love watching the news. Can't, I can't even watch it anymore because there's so many bad mushrooms. All right, then let's see here. Yeah, I think I'll skip a bunch of this. You, you'll either be lucky or unlucky that I'm skipping ahead. So disclaimer one, there's three disclaimers in this message. Disclaimer number one is this is about theology, not politics. You're going to hear me do something I never do in church. I'm going to talk about political things coming up. And I don't believe that church is the place to do that. I don't believe in endorsing candidates from the pulpit. I don't believe in, in, in preaching politics at church. But this is different. What I'm going to tell you is theology, not politics. It's just the thing I'm going to use is more of an example. Okay, so don't think that DCC is, is becoming a political spot. Um, we're just not. So I wanted to make that disclaimer. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh, the great Oz has spoken. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. Okay, so that to me is a picture of the truth of the bad mushrooms I'm seeing growing up around, around the world. Screw tape letters, one of my favorite things in screw tape letters is where the one demon talking to the other one says, one of our most powerful weapons is to make sure that they don't think we're real. Make sure they don't believe in us. God wants us to be light. God wants us to be out there. God wants us to be teaching. Satan wants to be hidden. He doesn't want you to see him. And the more people press forward believing there is no Satan, they also believe there is no God, right? If there's no ultimate evil, then there's no need for an ultimate good. So what we see is the projection. We see the image that the world and the flesh and the devil wants us to see, but they don't want us to look behind the curtain. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to open the curtain up, like I said, just on one of the lies, just on one area. But don't be fooled. Don't look at the, at, the, at the shiny stuff. Don't look at, at, at the screen. Don't look at what the world projects on there. Grow up and be smart. The Bible tells us to be wise. Look behind the curtain. Pull that curtain back, and, and, and you'll be surprised by what you see. So, oh, over here. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So start there when you're looking for truth. When someone comes to you and says, oh, this, this is a new thing, it's not. Right off the bat, it's a lie. There is nothing new under the sun. When this philosophy or this new religion or this new thing comes up, it's not new. So start right there. Your meter should be going off. Someone says, follow me here, follow me there. This is a new thing. Right off the bat, it's not true. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just a rehash of something that's already been. And it comes down to worldview. You can lump almost everything into someone's worldview. So a Christian worldview, people in a Christian worldview should be devoted to God. People in a non-Christian secular worldview are mostly dedicated to themselves. People in an anti-Christian ungodly worldview are devoted to evil, devoted to Satan, whether they know it or not, because some people are looking at the, the screen and they don't pull the curtain back. And there's good people that I know that when I was a Mormon, I, would, didn't look, I didn't look behind the curtain. I was pushing that agenda forward strongly, aggressively, pushing that agenda forward, thinking it was truth when it wasn't. I never looked behind the curtain until that day that, that the Lord got a hold of me and my sister led me to the Lord. Then the curtain went back, and I got to see who was in the shadows behind there. I got to see the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. I got to see what it really was. So the whole thing boils down to worldview. And... And like I said, there's too many fish out there in the sea, so I'm just going to focus on one. You've heard the old saying, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach a man how to fish, you'll never see him again on Sunday. <laughs> so I went fishing, and I came up with this one, with this one fish. And I'm going to talk to you about the woke worldview. Okay, because 
not that that one's at the top of anyone's list, not that it's the worst one, it's just the most common one now. It's really popular now. My son and I, that I spent thousands on his education, we argue over this. So let's talk about what woke is. To get it into a nutshell, here's kind of what it, what it kind of boils down to. The woke folks say that there's a problem. There's racism and injustice in the world. Well, if you look at that statement, I have to agree with that. It's true. There is racism and injustice in the world. I've traveled all over, I've traveled a lot of, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, all across the country. I've seen a lot of it. As in Africa two years ago, I've seen a lot of racism and a lot of injustice. The cause, lack of awareness, education, and oppression, it's a social problem. Well, now we're starting to get away from the truth. That's only partially true. And then the solution, raise awareness, create programs and policies, and people will change. Oppression will end, and the problem will be solved. That's absolutely untrue. There will be no utopia. There will be no paradise. There will be no peace on earth this side of the second coming of Christ. Even as a Christian, if you're looking at that, you're going to be disappointed. There will be no false utopia. There will be no people perfecting each other. There'll be no end to world hunger. There'll be no end to greed. There'll be no end to violence. Those things aren't going to end by awareness, programs, policies, and people will not change. Lenin tried it. Marx tried it. Hegel tried it. I was in the 60s. You know, we peace and love. We tried it. Um, it just doesn't work because the hearts of men are evil. We talked about that, that last week. The hearts of men are evil, and evil men cannot bring about that kind of change. Okay, then the Christian worldview. Here's kind of the antithesis of it. There is racism and injustice in the world. I agree with that, same statement. But the cause, the cause is not what they think the cause is. The cause is not a lack of awareness. The cause is sin. It's because of the fall of man. It's a spiritual problem. If you try to solve spiritual issues with social means, it's not going to work. You know, you've, you've heard the old, um, what's the old adage? Trying to do the same thing over and over and over again, expect different results is insanity. That's what this is. It's insanity. Trying to change spiritual issues by social policies is insane. It just, it, it, it cannot work. From, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. That's where you have to start. If you want to get racism out of the world, you need to change men's hearts. If you want to get oppression out of the world, you need to change men's hearts. I'm a real estate broker. Most of you know that. I can tell you right now, if I, if I went into my, my real estate classes, I have to take every year, I have to take classes on ethics, discrimination, and racism every year to keep my license current. There are laws that, there are books, there's RCWs, there's codes, there's ethics rules. There's a ton of policies and programs to end discrimination, yet discrimination happens every day. You can't take social programs and change the hearts of men. It just won't work. So what is the solution? Well, if the hearts of men are evil, we need a new heart. Ezekiel 11:19. I will give them a new heart and a new mind. I will take away their stubborn heart of stone and will give them an obedient heart. That's the solution. That's the cure. If our world, what, what's the verse say? If, 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 um, if our nation will humble itself, call it to God, God will send a revival to us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, that's how you solve racism. That's how you solve discrimination. That's how you solve oppression. That's how you solve all the, the gender confusion. That's how you solve all these problems, by changing the hearts of men, not by social programs, not by policies, not by laws. So summing up the woke worldview, says all of the world's problems are just social ills and they can be cured by awareness, education, understanding, and inclusion apart from any need for God. The Christian worldview says all of the world's problems are a result of man turning away from God, sin, and none of them can be cured by awareness, education, understanding, and inclusion apart from God. Now, I'm all for awareness. I'm all for inclusion. I'm all for, for um, education. Those things aren't bad. Those are truths with an S. Those are a truth. But if you try to apply them apart from God, they're useless. They're powerless. Like Paul says, why do you um, adhere to religions that are based out of man that say, do not touch, do not taste, all which have the appearance of wisdom 
in man-made religions, but are, of, but are of no value against the flesh. So Christian worldview versus work worldview. It's a matter of the last part. The woke worldview says everything is going to happen apart from any need from God. The Christian worldview says nothing will happen apart from God. So that's kind of where we have to stand. Disclaimer number two. Now we're going to come to the boring part of this. And this, this is boring. But it's a good example. So I had to put it in there. If woke is not new, because there's nothing under the sun, where did it come from? So I studied it. As I studied a lot this last few weeks. Woke is, woke is really a repackaging of four things. Its base is in Marxism. Marxism says there is no God. If you really, really look at the whole woke agenda, it's, it, it follows the Marxist agenda. The Marxist agenda was, remember the old dialectic? Do you guys learn that in college? The Marxist agenda was, you've got a synthesis, that's what is. You've got an antithesis, that's what you want. You put the two together, now you have a synthesis, you have something better. But the better thing is imperfect. So you do another antithesis, you make a new synthesis, and that one's still not perfect. But eventually, all these things will work themselves out, and eventually you come to, to the perfect society, which apart from God doesn't exist. That's why it failed. Marx tried it, Lenin tried it, Stalin tried it, even some Italian guys tried it. And, and, it, and it didn't work. Marxism says there is no God. Then materialism. Materialism says that only what you can touch and see and feel, this is, this is the reality. God is just a bunch of atoms. God isn't really real. Postmodernism says that the current culture decides what's right and wrong. That's postmodernism. Back a long time ago, it might have been wrong to, or it might have been okay to do something then, but now it's not okay. Or it might have been not okay to do something here, but in today's modern society, now it is okay. So postmodernism says, Current culture dictates who God is. Back when the world was in the Stone Age, we needed God because we couldn't explain natural phenomenon. Well, now we have science. We can explain natural phenomenon, so we don't need God anymore. Our current, our current culture dictates who and what God is. In the secular humanism, it says man is God. We're the epitome of evolution. If we are the epitome of a million years of evolution, like science says, then why is there still world hunger? Why is there still greed? Why is there still um, racism? Why is there still violence? Why did we have disco music? If, <laughs> if we have evolved for a million years, you'd think we could have done better than polyester leisure suits and disco music. Those two things alone prove to me that, that, that this can't work. So they've packaged all this up into a new religion, so isn't that nice? Now we have this new religion we can follow, and that's what I wanted to get across to you today. This whole woke thing, all it is is a new religion. But Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun, right? People have been doing this for generations and generations. It's not new. So Christians, don't freak out when you see it. Don't believe it. And to college kids and high school kids, just because you see people standing on a corner holding signs does not make the thing true. I know you're going to hate me for saying this, but just because your teachers say it doesn't make it true. Because God says it makes it true. Okay? You need to, we need to redraw some of those lines. We see people on TV shows. We see talk show hosts. We see TV pastors. We see athletes. We see politicians all trying to tell us what's true. Just because they say it doesn't make it true. We used to be people who said, in God we trust. Now we say, in Google we trust. And we've, we've completely turned away from the truth. We've turned our backs on God, and we've opened ourselves up to Google. And by Google, I just mean modernism. We will never get over this hump until we can go back to where we were. We need to get, you know, like I told you before, when you're hiking and backpacking, you get lost, you find yourself lost, you don't know where you're at. The first thing you do is you try to remember where's the last time you knew where you knew where you were. We need to go back to the truth. We need to go to the fact that the hearts of men are evil. God is good. God loves us. God saved us where we are. God offers us redemption. God offers us a new heart. God says he will take our hearts of stone and give us new hearts. God says he will take our minds and give us new minds. If we want to get past any social evils, that's where it's going to start. It's not going to start with programs. It's not going to start with policies. It's not going to start with new laws. It's not going to start by resurrecting an ancient religion and just calling it something new. You know, you got Diet Coke, and then the next week, you've got Zero Sugar Coke. Why? Because Zero Sugar is a trend now. It's the same thing. We've got food, and you stamp on the label. If you go in the grocery store, you'll see it. Keto-friendly. 
It's the exact same thing as last week, but now keto's in the news, so we've stamped it on the label. We need to not be taken in by a new stamp on the label. It's still the same thing. It's still, it's still humanism, it's still Marxism, it's still everything it was. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay, disclaimer three. This part is really boring and I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go really quick. Um, I just wanted to show you that, so if anyone's watching, that I just didn't make this up. I always tell my Bible study people, if Bob says it and you believe it's true because Bob said it, then I'll quit. So here's just a little bit of proof. I'm gonna go through quick because I don't wanna waste too much time on it. Here's, here's Hegel's philosophy about the dialectic. Um, you can read it back on YouTube if you want. There's his triangle, a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. And his philosophy was that as we keep going on with the synthesis, we'll become a better society. Well, this was back in the 20s. Do you think we're better off today than we were in the 20s? I mean, I wasn't alive then. Some of you might have been. I wasn't back in the 20s, but I don't think we're better off now than we were back in the 20s. So Marx sought to replace Christian worldview with a vile substitute. His rejection ran deeper than the old, old quoted jibe, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature. It's the heart of a heartless world. It's the soul of a soulless condition. It's the, it's the opium of the people. Remember hearing that back when communism was trying to take over the world? He believed that whilst belief in God is kind of a projection, the illusion itself stems from something that is quite proper to human um, faculties. He argued that religion is a kind of malfunction, the result of alienated labor. So remember when I showed you the Wizard of Oz? The projection was completely unreal. The guy behind the curtain is what was real, right? Almost everything Satan does is in exact opposition to God. In God, the projection is real. What God says is real is real, and it's not a malfunction. He take modern postmodernism, Marxism, the whole book idea, whatever God says, they oppose it directly. I'll give you some examples here before we close, but it's a direct opposition to what God says. Now Jesus came along and added the elements of compassion and love for the poor, but also for one's enemies. Marx didn't like that. He thought that the enemies were the, or the, the rich people needed to be wiped out and the poor people would, would come through. So Marx combined the Christian concern for social justice with a scientific analysis of the structures of, just, of injustice, and he laid the basis for the science of revolution, which would free humanity from those structures. He thought that if the comfort blanket of religion was taken away, um, the workers would have something, um, would have to do something about their terrible condition themselves. In Marxist dream of a communist revolution, religion would be abolished. Okay, now why am I bringing this up? This, this isn't a, a class in political science. I'm bringing it up because the goal hasn't changed. In Marxism, one of their main goals was to take God out of the picture and to abolish religion and family. Look at the bottom paragraph. Gramsci, an Italian guy, I hate that an Italian guy did this. Gramsci taught Marxists that to achieve Karl Marx's goal of abolishing private property, the family and the church and the nation state they did not need a bloody revolution that Marx had called for. In Western countries with their rich civil societies, it was better to infiltrate the cultural institutions and take them over and indoctrinate the people into abandoning their love for family and for God. That's, what's ha that's our revolution here. You don't see tanks and guns on the street for people crawling out for Marxism. What you see is a battle for the mind. You see, you see the whole woke movement it is based on this, but it's the new brand of it. Instead of driving a tank down the street, you get your university professors to believe it, and then your kids believe it. Instead of, instead of driving you know, tanks down the street, you get liberal and progressive pastors to preach it from their pulpits. And if you don't think it's happening, you're, you're mistaken. It's happening all around us. Abortion's okay, transgenderism okay, love is love. It's happening from our churches, not just from our schools. And what's gonna happen is the family and the church will crumble if we allow it to keep going on. I was talking to Ryan just the other day about the numbers in our youth group. We're losing the next generation rapidly. If any of you are school teachers or even grandparents, you can probably see it. We're losing this next generation rapidly. I've seen numbers published about how, how quickly it's coming down. We need as a group of people to stand up and speak the truth. Here's what's happened in Christianity. Most of us won't tell lies. Most of us won't buy into this. But on the flip side, most of us won't speak out against it either. Have, can, can, you, can you identify with that? Most of us don't want to get canceled. 
Most of us don't want to be hated. Most of us don't want to lose our jobs. Most of us don't want people to think we're stupid. So we will be okay with not telling the truth not, or not going on with the lies, but we're not going to speak out and tell the truth either. That is not what God's called us to do. When we're a group of people that believe the truth, understand the truth, speak out the truth, then the gates of hell won't prevail against us. If we're people who know the truth but are silent about it because we don't want to take any risks, we'll get, we'll get steamrolled. We're going to lose our kids. We're going to lose our next generation. Our churches and our families will start to crumble because we're being silent. That's not what God called us to. Um, let's see here. I got to get... I got to get going. So a few basic truths. We covered that last week. The truth, we covered that last week. There are consequences to breaking the laws of God, whether you like it or not. So here's kind of a chart I came up with. From left to right, from top to bottom up there, first, we were what I would call a godly nation. Remember, in God we trust is on our money. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, created by God. So we were, quote, a godly nation. Then we became a godly nation with a small g. Then we became an ungodly nation, and now we're working to where we're in an anti-godly nation. We used to be a Christian group of people, then we became a religious group of people, and that really bugs me, the whole thing of religion versus Christianity. We became a religious people, then we became a worldly people, now we're becoming an evil people. We used to say God is, then we start saying God was, now we're saying God never was, and then we're at the problem to where God is actually the problem. Remember I read you that excerpt last time? I've got it here. I won't read it again. But the author was saying that almost all of the world's problems have come because of religion. And I read you that last time. So we've gone from God is, the great I am, to the great I was, to the great I never was, to God is actually the problem. He's not the solution. We used to say upon these truths we stand as a church and as a nation. But as a church, a pastor I knew wrote a book called Upon These Truths We Stand. Um, really good book. Upon these truths we stand. Then we started getting more liberal and we say, upon some of these truths we stand. Then we said, there is no truth. So the progressives will go further and say, there is no truth to stand on at all. Then we say, just bring me a chair. I think I'll just sit. So that's kind of where we've ended up. And when I say we, I don't mean you guys here. I know we've got a good group here. But this is the way our nation's going. This is the way a lot of Christians are going. It's the way a lot of religions are going. It's the way our world is going. We're moving from left to right. A column I didn't put on there was the Bible. Remember, even in our courts, we used to swear on the Bible. Remember, and when you were a kid and someone thought you were lying, you'd say, oh, I swear on the Bible. Do any of you do that? Or is that, yeah, we used to do it in school all the time. So we used to believe in the Bible that the Bible was the truth. Then it got to where we started to liberalize a little bit. And we say, well, the Bible just contains the truth. It's not the truth. It's not all truth. The Bible contains truth. Some of the words of Jesus are right, but the other ones, well, that, that's, man wrote those. Then we got to, well, well, there really is no truth. The Bible is, is a book of stories and myths. It's got good advice, but it's not really the truth. It just stacks up with everybody else's books. Then we got to the point where we're saying, not only is the Bible not the word of God, not only does it not contain truths, it's actually anti, it's, it's anti-world. The Bible is repressive. The Bible is oppressive. The Bible is too narrow-minded. We've gone so far that I'm not sure how we get back anymore. Does that ring true with anybody or is it... Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip through all these because we kind of did these and we're really out of time now. This is the one I wanted to talk about, the, con the, the, the compromise. So God calls us to a, a Christian life. God calls us to a godly life. The world calls us to a woke life. Programs, principles, social justice will fix the world that way. Um, everything that you want to do is fine. You be you, let him be him, and, and it'll all work out. Well, God says, follow me. Be Christ-like. Be like my son. Um, be holy because I'm holy. So we try to walk that road, and there's compromises in between. Um, okay, so let me read you a couple of the... These are some of the things I wanted to get to real quick. So why does it matter that we compromise? We're all saved, right? If you're saved in the building, raise your hand. If you know you know Jesus, okay, just about everybody. If we already know we're saved, we know we're going to heaven, why does it matter... If we tell the truth, why does it matter if we do those things that we already know we're saved, we've given our lives to Christ, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? Okay, I'll read you just a couple of verses real quick. First of all, it's God's plan for us. Matthew 28, go into all the world and teach, right? Uh, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe what I've said. It's God's plan for us, Matthew 28. Um, 
Matthew 5, 14, God wants us to be seen. You are the light of the world. It's God's plan that we're seen. When we're unseen and we're silent, we're compromising. Even if you're not actively in sin, if you're not speaking the truth, if you're not being the light of the world and being seen, you're not following what God created you for. Um, he told um, Peter, feed my sheep. And then not only that, he asked that we have to get it right. Um, Matthew 18 says, if you lead my sheep astray, it's better for you that a heavy millstone be tied around your neck and be thrown in the sea. Not only do we have to preach the truth, we've got to get it right. We have to understand it and take some time. Um, Jeremiah 23, woe to the shepherds who scatter the sheep. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, if the trumpet makes an indistinct sound, who will prepare for battle? If we as a church can't tell the truth, the world has no, the world has no hope. If we as Christians who know the truth, if we don't proclaim it and live it and show it, those who don't know the truth are destined for the other side because they're the only ones talking. All, what, what's, the, what's the saying that all that has to happen for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing? You get the time for us to do nothing is past. We're not in that kind of generation anymore. The gates of hell are starting to prevail against us. So the time to just be a good neighbor, the time to just have Christ in your heart and be quiet, the, the, the time's gone. The, 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 the plans of the world are starting to steamroll us. It's time to stand up, speak out, use your words, um, be the light. My wife and I were in Woodby Island a little while ago, and I saw a sign on the church we drove by. It's a cool sign. It said, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. So I get it, you know, live your life so that people see you, be the light of the world. But that time has passed. It's time to use your words. It's time to speak the truth. Um, an in, in, in indistinct, in indistinct sound, no one get ready for war. Um, First Peter, always be ready to give a defense and an account. Second Timothy, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who knows how to accurately handle the word of truth. Um, where have he? Oh, and, and God said, if me or if, if an angel from heaven, anybody preaches you a gospel other than the gospel I'm giving you, let them be accursed. So it's not just a neutral thing. Let's see how far ahead I can go. So where does, where does the truth come from? John 14, 6, Jesus is the truth. Um, truth came from God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, recorded in the Bible through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If that's true, then why are there so many churches? Why are there different churches in every corner? It's because we major on minor things. An example is, I think that all Christians who've ever read the Bible with any understanding at all will all agree that Jesus is coming back. Right? There's a second coming of Christ. But we don't agree on when, where, how. Is it pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill? Is it pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? We take these minors and we split the kingdom apart for it. And now there's a church in every corner. Rather than the church of Squim, where people could look at us as the light of the world and say, all those guys from every race, every creed, every culture, they're all together worshiping one God. They don't see that. They see a church on every corner split and divided by little minor things. Boy, there's so much of this I wanted to talk about. Let's see. Um, so what happened to the truth? John 8, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Romans 1, um, men suppress the truth in lies. Let's see. Yeah, skip that. Sorry, guys. Okay, so we know the truth. So what are some of the lies? The lies are that if you don't like the truth, just change it. Okay, some of the examples are um, the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible. You know, in the Bible, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. You guys familiar with that? People studied the whole Jehovah's Witness religion. They put that one little letter in their A, and it changes the entire basis of faith. The Mormons say that not only is there a God, every one of you can progress to become a God. Um, oh, and you know, we, <laughs> this one is sickening. How many of you have heard of the King James Bible? How many of you have heard of the Queen James Bible? That just got published. Go Google that one. So if you don't like the truth, just change it. So now there's a Bible out. It's being published. You can buy it on Amazon if you want. It's called the Queen James Bible. Every reference to homosexuality has been taken out of it. It's called the Queen James Bible. So if you don't like the truth, just change it. And then progressivism. You can just take the truth and make it what you want. It can just apply to you. And then hypocrisy. Gosh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to go quick. The hypocrisy of the movement. First of all, they say everyone is included, except Christians. Everyone has a value, except Christians. Live your truth, unless your truth is Christianity. 
Everyone has the right to be themselves without judgment, except for Christians. And mine value all life, except for preborn people. Don't value them at all. Um, so we've become a cancel culture. That was the question I asked you before. Are you willing to be a Daniel? Are you willing to be a Joshua and speak the truth out, even though it's not popular, even though it might cost you something, even though it's risky? Are you going to compromise? Are you happy enough to be saved, have your ticket punched, and, and just live, on, live your life quietly? Or will you be someone that stands up, tells the truth, speaks the truth, and is willing to take the consequences? Um, let's see here. Did that, did that. Did that. Oh, we're almost done. Okay, so we really are almost done. This is the last page. So there's one verse I've got to read to you before I let you go. It is Galatians chapter 3. So you can tell if you're a real Christian, if your Bible has ribbons in it. And I've got two ribbons in mine. Okay, Galatians 3.26. Here's the answer. Because a lot of us want to have an answer. We don't know the answer. And this is a long, kind of convoluted thing. But when you meet woke people, they'll tell you that it's about race, it's about social injustice, and it's about gender. Okay, those are the three big, those are the three big things. Does, can any of you think of a verse where God talks about those things? Okay, there's nothing new under the sun. God's seen this before. It's happened before. So listen to these verses. This verse is the answer to the whole thing. Okay, Galatians 3.26 says... For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized in Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is race. There is neither slave nor free man. There is social injustice. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Race, social status, and gender, God's already addressed them. The whole woke movement can be countered in that one verse. Let me read it again. We'll end with this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That covers race. There is neither slave nor free man. That covers social oppression. There is, neither, there is neither male nor female. There's gender. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. What it's saying is that it's not that those things don't exist. It's saying that God doesn't see you that way. You can identify as anything you want. God only identifies you as in Christ or not in Christ. God only identifies you as your name is in the book, your name is not in the book. God only identifies you as you are saved or you're not saved. All these other things, God's, this is God speaking. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. I don't see you that way. And people will tell you that Christianity is a social construct meant to control people. I hear that one all the time. This is a social construct meant to control people. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Oh, whoa. Step back. Just... Out loud. There you go. Thank you. Hello? Check. That better? Great. Everybody hear me? Up on the shelf, can you hear me? Great. Okay. First item today. Uh, oh yeah. Has everyone picked a moving buddy? What? Moving buddy? You can't be serious. Well, I didn't know we were supposed to have one already. But we have to hold hands. Oh, yeah. You guys think this is a big joke. We've only got one week left before the move. I don't want any toys left behind. A moving buddy. If you don't have one, get one. Okay, so you guys who've heard me preach before know I usually have two conclusions, sometimes three. One for saved people, one for unsaved people. Here's the conclusion for unsaved people. Moving buddies, if you don't have one, get one. Salvation, if you don't have it, get it. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. Trust Woody, if you don't trust me. There's, there's, only, there's only one week till moving day. We don't know when that day's coming. There is a moving day on the earth. The earth has an expiration date. Remember I told you last week, we don't know when that date is. So salvation, if you don't have it, get it. Otherwise, you'll be left behind. Please forgive. Too many mine. Too many mine? Hi. Mind the soul, mind the people, what? Mind the enemy, too many mind. No mind. No mind.
Not that matters, but I can do all that. <laughs> you sound skeptical. Okay, so no mind. Another quick disclaimer, the whole no mind philosophy is really a Zen philosophy that I don't believe in. But the concept is good. We mind the people, we mind the weapons, we mind the enemy, we mind being laughed at, we mind being canceled, we mind, well, what if I don't know what to say? What if I say, do you want to get saved? And someone says, yes, and I don't know what to tell them. What if they say, yeah, I want to get saved, but I still want to keep my lifestyle? I don't know what to tell them. We're not the marketing branch of Christianity. You don't have to just sell it. All you have to do is tell the truth the way God wrote it. Because if you tell it the way God wrote it, you don't have to be embarrassed by it, and you don't have to apologize for it. Tell it the way God wrote it. Don't add anything into it. Don't take anything out of it. If someone has a problem with that, then they have a problem with God, not with you. When you start changing it and making it the Burger King kind of theology, have it your way, it doesn't work. So don't go for the Burger King theology. Have one mind. The Bible says in two places, have the same mind and the same heart among you. Don't be divided. Have the same mind and same heart. So don't go Zen on me, but that was the point there. And then the last thing, this is my conclusion for Christians. It's a boat tied to the dock that's sinking. Have you ever seen a boat in dock sink? Okay, I used to own a company in California called California Commercial Divers. It was a scuba diving company. We maintained the bottoms of boats. We did salvage. We did stuff. I got a call one night that now early in the morning, I got a call early in the morning that a boat tied to two slips had sunk and it was wrecking the, do it was wrecking the harbor. So I go, I go down there and there was um, a, a, a harbor, you know, Santa Cruz Yacht Harbor. So you've got a safe place. Then there was the dock with the slips. It was in the slip tied in, totally safe. Well, do you know what a through hole is? Have you heard that term? A through hole is when you purposely draw, drill a hole in the side of a boat so that if you have a sink or something, the water can drain out above the water line. So if the boat sits there, the water's here, the hole is there, you're all cool. Well, that boat was tied there well, all night long during the storm. The boat rocked a little bit. And the, and the waves came up a little bit. And a gallon went in this time, and a gallon went in next time, and overnight that boat sunk in the harbor. Thousands of dollars of teak and electronics and the whole bit, but the harbor master didn't care. He just wanted me to get the dock fixed. So we go there. And the way to get a sunken boat out is you have to displace all that water. So you put inner tubes in there that are flat, fill them up, and then you got air in there. You put barrels in there, fill them up, and eventually the boat, the gunnels rise above the water line. You can pump the water out. My point to us as Christians is God has given us a harbor. We're saved. We're safe in our harbor. We have salvation. We're in the harbor. God's given us a dock to tie up to. It's Christian fellowship. It's the church. So you as a Christian seeing this church, you are in a safe harbor because you've given your life to Christ. You are in a safe place because you're in a church and fellowship, home group, you're surrounded by other Christians. But I've got to warn you, you can still sink sitting right where you are. The Bible tells us it's the little foxes that spoil the vineyards. You start letting that kind of philosophy get into your life, the things we've just gone over, and you will sink. <laughs>
all have a happy Father's Day. We do celebrate that in Texas. It's not as important as Mother's Day. You know, his conclusion was, the one that he didn't mention, is he had a slide with my cell phone number on it for anybody that had any complaints or general arguments about his, his sermon today. And of course, immediately once he told me that, I had my phone number changed on my smartphone. So it was going to work out either way. But let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for the truth. We thank you that you are the truth, that your word is the truth, God. And in a world that scrambles, uh, but yet is looking for truth, Lord, we, we know where that's found. And so we pray, God, that we not be shy about telling others about life that can be found in Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this day. Let us serve you today and throughout this week. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.